Um, hello, everybody. Good to see you all. It's January, so yes. I must be in Washington, D.C. <laughs> um, I saw that film that you've watched tonight for the first time a few months ago when Martha Davis, the director, came over to London to show it. And it had a particular poignancy at the time because it was, um, the hunger strike was still raging at Guantanamo. And, uh, and obviously what we're seeing in that film is a, a long history of uh, the torture that's been practiced by the United States and by uh, medical personnel and psychologists and psychiatrists over the last 12 years. And specific programs that have taken place in that period are no longer happening, but the abuse of hunger strikers is something that was very contemporary then, and it's still with us, even though we're not hearing so much about it. Um, so I think as we're preparing for the anniversary tomorrow, we're, we all need to be aware that we, we don't actually know how many people are on a hunger strike at the moment, that your hunger strike and many of you in solidarity with. Uh, because the, the US military has stopped releasing the figures of how many people are on a hunger strike. Um, it seems to me very much to preempt uh, what happened last year, which was that the information that came out from the prison about how many people were on a hunger strike was something that was picked up by the world's media, was picked up by people around the world, and led to the pressure that was put on President Obama to achieve the limited progress in releasing prisoners that has happened over the last few months. Um, I don't know whether we're going to find... I suspect what will happen is that we will we'll find out more from some of the prisoners who can get their stories out through their lawyers. Um, but, uh, but certainly there are people in Guantanamo now who are still on hunger strike. Um, you know, the progress that we've, that, that has been achieved in the last year, since I saw many of you a year ago, um, is down to the prisoners themselves. Uh, last year, I think, I think everybody would agree that on the 11th anniversary of the opening of Guantanamo, the thing that most of us were looking at was, a, was a, a, an endless uphill struggle of where we were going with this, this, this mission that we were all on to get this place closed down. Because uh, we, were, we were two and a half years, really, at that point, into, into trying to deal with almost complete inaction by President Obama, who had faced opposition in Congress and have chosen not to oppose Congress, but just to give it. Because, frankly, it wasn't worth spending political capital and enraging Republicans on dealing with the festering sore that is going to happen. And um, so, you know, it took the prisoners to force him to act. And uh, as the word of the hunger strike got out last year, it seemed amazing to me, as though all around the world, in newsrooms and editorial departments, people had found the same memo that they hadn't noticed, which was actually the pay of the 10th anniversary of Guantanamo, which gave all the reasons why Guantanamo remains a moral, legal, and ethical abomination, and why anyone who calls himself a journalist needs to be thinking about this, and writing about it, and trying to get it closed down. And the world's media picked up on it, and then the European Parliament got involved, and the United Nations got involved. The pressure was put on President Obama, and he made promises and began to act. And those are the limited successes that we can reflect on that have happened over the last year. Uh, President Obama said he would appoint envoys to help with the release of prisoners and work towards the closure of Guantanamo. And he has indeed appointed those two men. He's appointed Paul Lewis in the Pentagon and Cliff Sloan in the State Department. He has released 11 people since he was forced into action by the hunger strikers. Uh, that's considerably more than were released in the previous three years when just five men were released from the Um He also uh, dropped a ban on releasing Yemeni prisoners from Guantanamo that he had imposed in January 2010. You're a well-informed crowd, so you probably remember that after a Nigerian man tried and failed to blow up a bomb in his underwear and playing down for Detroit on Christmas Day 2009, there was a huge backlash against releasing Yemenis from Guantanamo. Funnily enough, just after some Yemeni prisoners had been released from Guantanamo, and President Obama imposed a ban 
Um, and then Congress weighed in with their own ban as well. The President Obama dropped his ban in May when he made all these other promises. Now, that's good, but we haven't had any Yemenis released since he dropped his ban. So it's kind of irrelevant if he dropped his ban if he's not actually going to release anybody. The facts are there are 155 men still in Guantanamo. 76 of those men were cleared for release by a high-level interagency task force the President Obama established shortly after he took office. They issued their final report in January 2010, four years ago, and they approved for release from Guantanamo 76 of the men who are still held. So we've had 11 releases last year, and that's the good news. We have only one thing to push for tomorrow, really, on the anniversary, and that's to say we need these other 76 guys to be released as well. And what we need to be making clear is that uh, we don't really want to cynically look at the releases in the run-up to the anniversary, which were an attempt, possibly, to diffuse media interest in what we're talking about tomorrow, the start of the 13th year of operations at Guantanamo. So we have to push for the release of the Yemenis because they make up 55 of these 76 clear prisoners. 55 men in Guantanamo, cleared for release by the task force in 2010, so during deliberations that were made in 2009. Some of these men were cleared for release by military review boards under the Bush administration in 2006 and 2007. How much more information do we need to see that these people have just become part of the game of political football. They should be home with their families. When you hear the kind of hysterical rhetoric that comes from right-wingers primarily in Congress about how dangerous these people are, how we can't release them, and how recidivism and all these lies that they talk about, about how dangerous people release from Guantanamo are, which are mostly lies. I'm sure there are, so there are some cases of people who have engaged in activities against the United States after their release. But the overwhelming majority of people released in Guantanamo are totally out of their lives. And that's the story of these Yemenis. Um, so tomorrow I hope we can really focus on the Yemenis who make up the majority of these people. I know that some of you know their individual stories. And, and just think about that, because most of these guys were what? They were in their early 20s when they were captured. They're probably in their mid-30s now. They just want to go home. They, they really just want to go home, they want to be back with their families, they want to try and resume their lives. Um, so, yeah, that's the message, really. There are, of course, other men in Guantanamo, there are 79 other men in Guantanamo. I don't want anyone to forget about those men, because they are largely forgotten about, as far as the administration is concerned. They're not even at the front of the queue, trying to get out of there because of the process of clearing people for release that is actually very difficult to achieve. These guys, the rest of the guys are not even there. They're either supposed to be put on trial, or they've been designated for ongoing imprisonment without charge or trial. And 46 of those men were specifically designated for ongoing detention without charge or trial by President Obama. And I think that that remains important. This is a president who inherited a problem from President Bush. We all understand that. He inherited a monstrous problem from President Bush, where Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld had taken all the existing laws and treaties and smashed them up, and had created this problem of people being held indefinitely. But Obama's task force recommended to him that 46 of the men who were still held were too dangerous to release, but that inconveniently there wasn't enough evidence to put them on trial. Well, that's not evidence, is it? That's a, that's a very dubious collection of, of information masquerading as evidence used to justify, let's be clear, to justify holding people indefinitely, possibly for the rest of their lives, without charge or trial. And we have to trust the people who told us this, that these people are too dangerous to release. But they can't really tell us why. So these 46 men, this is the current president has passed this piece of legislation that is supposed to justify that. And, you know, it is a hallmark of a tyranny, not of a responsible society that respects the rule of law, to be holding people without charge or trial. 
You can hold people without charge of trial if you capture them on a battlefield in wartime and give them the protections of the Geneva Conventions and release them when that battle is over. But that has never been the case with these guys. These guys were stripped of all rights as human beings by President Bush on January 11th, 2002, when he opened that prison. And specifically, those 46 men designated for indefinite detention in that executive order that President Obama issued in March 2011 are without rights. Still. So we must remember them and push for justice for them as well as pushing for the release of the men who are clear for release. Because there is a process out of the way of what we call periodic review boards. When President Obama issued the executive order to, uh, to uh, approve the ongoing detention without charge or trial of these men, the only way that he could avoid a, a, an absolute tsunami of opposition from human rights groups and from lawyers was that he promised there would be periodic reviews of these men's cases. And those periodic reviews didn't happen until the end of November this year. I'm sorry, last year. Just six weeks ago. It took nearly three years to set up the periodic. Such was his disdain for these people, frankly. Now, we still don't know what the outcome of this is because there's only been one periodic review board. There are 71 men, apparently, who are going to have their cases reviewed. Only one of those reviews has taken place. And uh, the enemy man in Guantanamo spent six hours arguing why he should be released. We haven't heard anything yet about what actually took place that day. Nothing has been unclassified. It's not clear when it will be or how much it will be. Which doesn't give me much hope that there's a transparent process in place here with any intention of releasing any of these people. And I hope that that's not the case. I hope that there is going to be some attempt to reevaluate the, the, the continuing overreaction really, of a bunch of largely insignificant people at Guantanamo who, one way or another, people are trying to give the impression that they're much more than they are. So those are all our people to think about. I'd like to thank all of you because I know that many of you that are here tonight are people who do spend a lot of time thinking about these men, not just in terms of the values that have been betrayed by America in holding them, but that these are human beings as well. There are two things important happening here. One is the betrayal of American values and the other is the dehumanization of people who we need to remember are human beings. So thank you very much.